Well, thank you for logging on. This is the Four Points Broadcast with Dr. Cindy Trim. I'm Pastor Ryan, and we're excited in the room that you've joined us from around the world. Go ahead and hit that share button right now so all of your friends on social media can be empowered by this message as well. It's an incredible series. It's called The DNA of Destiny. How many of you have been receiving a lot from this series? It's been life-changing. We're here with our life group, but, but with this series, we're, we're launching uh, um, our life group curriculum. So if you want to uh, start a life group right where you're at, amongst your friends or your colleagues or family members, email us at info at cindytrimministries.org and we'll send you all of the details. Amen. It's, it's, a, it's a, an opportunity for you to connect on a deeper level and we're going to resource you and give you all the tools that you need to do that. Um, it, it, it's an amazing series, and we know that Revelation is going to hit you, and right when it does, we want you to tweet about it, we want you to Facebook it, and use the hashtag DestinyDNA and connect to the conversation that's going on around the world. Well, I want to bring her to the platform right now, the woman of God, Dr. Cindy Trim. Come on, can you welcome her? How y'all doing tonight? It's another great day on planet Earth. Any day above zero is a good day to praise the Lord. We've been engaging you in our series called The, the DNA of Destiny, and we've spent uh, a couple of weeks actually just excavating the whole fact that your destiny is attached to decisions. And we've given you examples from uh, Moses and the decision that he had to make, Abraham, decisions that he made, and many, many different people throughout the Bible that had made, had to make decisions. But in John chapter 5, um, and we're going to go directly into the word, John chapter 5, we're reading from verse number 2. There's a very interesting story, and you can easily miss it because there's, this is a text that is always preached about. So you can actually miss some of the uh, layered revelation that is there. But as you turn to John chapter 5, we want to welcome you to your life group. This is my life group. They are lit. They are on fire. They are making such a heavy demand. And we greet each one of you meeting around the world um, with your life groups all the way in Latvia and Germany and Paris and uh, all Brazil, all over the world, South Africa, Nigeria. There are life groups all over the world meeting simultaneously. And we are thanking God for the presence of God that is going to be there. And we pray that you, you will experience spontaneous deliverance and spontaneous healing as you believe the Lord for your breakthrough. Tonight is going to be a night of breakthroughs. Breakthrough in revelation that's going to take your life to the next level. Let's just pray and ask God to bless our time together. Our dear Father, we thank you for the time that you have allotted us that we could spend just combing through the word, excavating the word, pulling out the pearls of revelation. And that is lying there waiting for us to be able to pull them out and apply them for our, to our own life. That the truth that will be re revealed to us that will have a liberating effect for we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. And so tonight we pray that the anointing will be one that would liberate our minds and hearts so that we can go on and do those things that you have commissioned and called us to do without feeling that somehow we are locked in and prohibited by the limitations that uh, other individuals have used to uh, abort or even forfeit the great opportunity of adventure in the realm of the spirit in uh, being able to um, discover our purpose and then maximize our potential. What a great adventure it is with the Holy Spirit who navigates the path that we should take and to show us the charted course that you had in mind for us before the foundation of the world. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless our time together and bless those that are meeting around the world in their life groups, and especially this life group tonight. Bless them and give them strategies and insights and give them principles that they can apply immediately to their lives, and then give them the faith and the courage to do so. We pray that their lives will never be the, be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. The power of decision making. We're going to talk to you about the power of decision making today. John chapter five. Now, there was 
at Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halted, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. And we learned uh, in our last um, lesson about these individuals, they were impotent. They lacked power. So they were disempowered. So a disempowered person is a danger. They're a danger to society because they really don't care. But they're also a danger to themselves. They're going to end up doing things to themselves, to their body, to their relationships that will end up hurting them and sabotaging the greatness that is on the inside of them. Jesus, when he died, he came to restore that which was lost. And what we lost, we lost our ability to think like heaven's representative, to think like God. We lost our dominion. We lost our sensibility. We lost our way. We lost our authority and power because we fe fell out of a realm of dominion. And what Jesus, when he died, did for us, he is allowing us to uh, be restored back to that place, that place of dominion. And it's a realm that you live in. Anytime you live in the kingdom, you live in a realm of power, empowerment, a realm of authority, a realm of wealth, affluence, and influence. And so you can see why the enemy wants us to be ignorant concerning who we are in Christ Jesus and to hold us um, in a somewhat of a mental and emotional and psychological uh, soul tie with the Babylonian system. There are a lot of people that are saved, genuinely saved, but they're not delivered. And we're not talking about demons coming out of you, but we're talking about being uh, able to be birthed into a new realm of power away from the source of your original paradigm. Your paradigm is a mental model. It's um, the way that you see yourself in this world. It's the way that you process information. It's the way you interpret experiences. And two people can have the same experience at the same time, but their interpretation will be different. And it's based on a paradigm. And so here was a man with the paradigm hanging around impotent folk. That was his paradigm. We have to wait for someone to do something for us. We have to wait for someone to be kind to us. We can't eat until someone feeds us. We can't drink until someone gives us water. And everyone in his community was like that. And that the Bible said they were halted and withered. They were waiting for the moving of the water. It's interesting because they believed that an angel had to move the water. So the moving of the water simply means that there was some... Um, uh, external force that was going to cause the water to ripple, not knowing that they could cause ripples themselves, you know, and they, 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 they were waiting on God, you know, and uh, they felt as if, and they used it as an excuse, well, God must want me to be this way, because if he didn't, then things would be different, and I would be different, and the circumstances would be different, um, and so they had this uh, uh, oral tradition that was passed down. It was just a story that they believe that only one person a year got a chance to break away. Nobody else is going to break away, and the rest of us are going to have to stay like we are. And then they had this oral tradition that was passed down um, that whosoever then first, um, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And if you, you are not first, well, then, oh, well, you're just going to have to stay like that until next year. And if someone goes ahead of you, then you're not going to have the opportunity. And somehow we, we grow up with this limiting belief that there's not enough to go around for all of us, you know, and that somehow success is not for everybody. Prosperity is not for everybody. It's just for the few lucky uh, individuals that have been favored, and the rest of us are not favored. Almost as if we believe the lie that favor ain't fair. Um, uh, favor is not just for some of us, it's for all of us. And we usually say it after we make it in life. But before we make it in life, we're all favored. After we make it in life, favor ain't fear. Um, but favor is for all of us. As long as you're a part of this dispensation of grace, the Bible said there will come a time that God will favor us. And this is our time. It's during this dis dispensation where we're all favored. Grace is synonymous with favor. You know, and uh, God's grace gives you the power to do what you couldn't do in and of yourself. The Bible says that uh, they believed this lie and they had it perpetuated 
intergenerationally. This particular man was there for 38 years. We don't know how he got there. We don't know his age. All we know is that he was locked in a system for 38 years. And he believed the lie, too, because it was perpetuated. So they were all people of the lie. And the Bible says that a certain man had been there, um, had an infirmity for 38 years when Jesus saw him lie. And in our last message, we talked about the problem with lying and what it really means. It doesn't just mean to, to recline horizontally. It means to misrepresent the truth. And we were talking about misrepresenting the truth of who you are. You learn to, to not to be um, boastful. And people believe that if you say that you're good at something, somehow you're boasting and you're arrogant. But, but how can people know what you bring to the table unless you tell them? And, uh, you know, you want to give God glory. You want to be able to give God glory. And, and you see, when, when we talk about being humble, the scripture in Matthew chapter 5 talks about being meek. Meekness is not the same thing as lying about who you are. You see, because you, a lot of people are so insecure. When you know that you're powerful at doing something, they want you to lie to make them feel better about their insecurity. You see, so I, when, when I go for a doctor, I want the best in town. So I always interview any, any professional that I use. I always interview them. It, it, it doesn't matter. Are, are you good at what you do? And if they say, I'm all right, I hang up the phone. Because I'm looking for the best. And if you, think, you, if you don't think that you're all right, you know, you, you know, people are looking for the best. So they want the best doctor, the best lawyer. Am I correct about it? The best realtor. When I moved to Georgia, I called up a couple of friends and they say, who is the best uh, doctor? Who is the best dentist? And they told me who the best was. And I went after the best. Now, if it's fine for you to go after the best, how come you can't be the best in your industry? Why do you have to be the worst? Why do you have to be the second best? Why can't you be the best too? Why? And so it's interesting because, again, people want us to lie. And I, I remember reading an article about a gentleman. He was an excellent writer. And he said, people think that I'm arrogant, but I'm really not. Because why would I lie about being good at what I do? I'm a good writer. You know, I, and, and I'm a good speaker. Now, I can't do everything. I can sing, but uh, Arista Records don't think I can sing. <laughs> They haven't given me a contract. I'm good with holding the mic, but they haven't given me a contract. I'm a good speaker. I'm a good communicator. I'm a good writer, but I'm not a good singer. Are you with me? I have a few of my friends that say, girl, you can sing. And I said, well, I'm giving you passes to the backstage, but I just haven't got on the front stage yet. But, 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 but you know, when we think about a person being meek, to be meek simply means that you acknowledge what God has placed in you, but you also acknowledge the source. You see, meekness has to do with you acknowledging the source. If you sing, yes, I could sing good, but it's only because of him. Do you see that? You see the difference? So if, if, if God made you an excellent dancer, you know, and you're a principal dancer, why would you say I'm not that good? That, isn't that lying? When you really can blow and you've got pipes and, and people are paying to go to your concert and you say, nah, I'm not that good. When you stand up and you get a gold medal at the Olympics and they interview you, it's, it's a lie to say, oh, I'm not that good. I'm just being humble. No, I'm the best in the world. To God be the glory. I can sing. To God be the glory. I can dance. To God be the glory. I'm beautiful. To God, because he could have given you an ugly gene. To God be the glory. Are you with me? So when people give you a compliment, stop lying and acting as if, you know, you don't know. You're going to give God glory. You're going to give God glory. We call people arrogant when they know who they are and they know they're good at something and they refuse to act otherwise. Are you with me? They, why would you lie if you're good at something? But give God the glory. 
So here was this man lying amongst other individuals that were lying with him. They were misrepresenting the truth of who they were. And the scripture says that Jesus came in and when he saw him lie and knew he had been there for a long time, he asked him a question. This is verse number six. Wilt thou be made whole? Now, notice the question doesn't say, do you want to be healed? The question says, do you want to be whole? And the scripture uses a word, say if. He say if unto him, S-A-I-T-H, say if. That's not just old English. It's a present active continuous. In other words, that verb he kept saying, present active continuous verb. He kept asking him, wilt thou be made whole? Do you want to be whole? Do you want to be whole? And every time he was asking, well, my mama, do you want, do you want, my daddy, do you, the government, do you, what? Do you want? And bombarded his mind, brought him to a crisis point where he had to say yes or no. Because it was a closed-ended question. And a closed-ended question require either a yes or no. I am not asking you about the 38 years. I'm not asking you about you laying up in the rain. I'm not asking you about you not having a blanket when it was cold. I'm not asking you about the people that didn't help you. They walked by because what he was looking for is pity and that was learned behavior. You don't want pity, you want principles. You don't need anybody's pity. You don't need anybody feeling sorry for you because that's all you got all your life. You've got people feeling sorry for you and you are still in the same place. People in, in, intuitively and instinctively realize that they have greatness in them. It's something instinct. And for some people it's been beaten out of them. And if, it's, if, it, if it wasn't physical, it was, it was verbal where people beat you down so that they can control you. You see, the moment you start making decisions for yourself, people will begin to resent you because they have given away their personal power. And when you take your personal power back, who gave you the nerve to think that you're better than us? You don't need permission. God gave you permission. You know, the greatest gift that you can give yourself is, is the gift of goodbye. When you go home, you're going to have to tell some people goodbye. You're going to have to have to tell some circumstances goodbye. And you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to do it deliberately. You're going to have to do it consciously. And you're going to have to do it consistently until the spirit realm, until your friends get the message that I'm not staying around. I'm not doing this anymore. I can't live like this another day. I don't want to feel like this another day. I don't want to uh, go to bed with my heart pounding, wondering how I'm going to pay bills, wondering what, what, what friend is going to walk out on me next. I don't want to live this way any longer. And because you make a decision not to live that way, you don't have to live that way another day in your life. You don't have to live where you're living. You don't have to work where you're working. You don't have to take what you're taking. You don't have to allow people to talk to you as if your name is Matt, walk all over you. You don't have to take it. You don't have to be treated that way. The moment you know your value and your worth is the moment you are empowered to be everything that God wants you to be. And you don't have to ask for permission. And I can imagine as Jesus asking him, he's trying to imagine, now, for 38 years, I haven't had to cook. For 38 years, I haven't had to pay a mortgage. For 38 years, I haven't had to work. For 38 years, I haven't had to carry myself anywhere. For 38 years, I haven't had to do any of this. Do I want to be whole? Because if I'm whole, I, I don't have any more excuses. If I'm whole, I can't beg anymore. If I'm whole, I'm going to have to work. If I'm whole, I'm going to have to make my own salary. If I'm whole, I'm going to have to be an innovator. If I'm whole, I'm going to have to pay my own bills. If I'm whole, I'm going to have to keep my own lights on. If I'm whole, I'm going to have to. If I get whole, if I don't have any problem, I don't have any pity, and people are not going to give me any. Do I want that? Do I want to be respected? 
responsible for my own success? Do I want to be responsible for my own prosperity? Do I want to be responsible for my own failure? You mean to tell me I can't blame the government anymore? I can't blame my husband anymore? When you take 100% responsibility for your life, when you take 100% responsibility for your life, for your success, for your failure, for your joy, for your happiness, for your disappointment, when you take 100% responsibility, something amazing happens in the realm of the spirit. You will begin to feel heaven conspiring with earth to get the resources to you, to get the divine hookup to you, to get the resources you need to start your business, to go back to the school. Something amazing happens when you stop begging. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Have you put any thought to what you want and why you want it? Have you put any thought towards that? And we talked about earlier how to keep your own rhythm. You got to keep your rhythm in life. You know, life has a rhythm. You should have a rhythm too. Never allow someone else's urgency to become your priority. Teach me to number my days. Give me the ability to manage my activities according to time frames. What, 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 what goals did you set for this year? What specific goals? A goal has a start date and a finish date. What specific goals? When did you start? When did you finish? When are you going to finish? What goals are you establishing for next year? What goals are you establishing the year after? Eventually, it's going to explode, and you're going to have everything you want. You're going to accomplish everything that you want. You're going to be able to do everything that you want to do. Do you want? What do you want? I don't, I'm, I don't care about what other people want. I'm asking you. And then finally, he said, I do want to be whole. Then he said, take up your bed and walk. Because I'm not going to be a crotch to you. And I'm not going to be an alibi. The devil deceived him into believing that he had no other option. And this was how his story was going to end. It is what it is. It ain't what it ain't. But when Jesus came into his life, Jesus came as an interrupter. And he interrupted things. And he disrupted things so that he could have another script in life to be able to say, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Do you want to be whole, not healed? He was sick in his mind. His thought life was bankrupt. He had mental impotency. It wasn't just physical. It was mental. It was mind over matter. What are the, the medical conditions um, that we talk about is psychosomatics. And that's the state of being where the mind is closed to any other alternative for wholeness. That's what psychosomatic is. Your mind is absolutely closed to any other alternative for being whole. And so he was psychosomatic. His lameness was self-imposed. Someone is that way. So it, it, in, in other words, you know, people talk about, I was born this way, but you don't have to die that way. That's the thing. It was learned helplessness, and he learned excuses. He learned excuses, and Jesus said, look, it's time for you to stand up on your own two feet. Take up your bed and walk. Stand up on your own two feet, and you are going to get your personal empowerment back where you're not relying and leaning on people and your boss and uh, to, to make things happen for you, where you have networks that you're equally contributing to one another's success. It's not just one of you in your network that's successful. It's all of you that are successful. You're not going to be the only one in your family that is successful. Your sons are going to be successful. Your daughter is going to be successful. You're not going to be the only one paying everybody's bills. Because, look, they made their decisions, and you make yours. And that usually happens in people's family where there's one successful one, and then the whole lazy family say, can you pay my bill? Can you pay my car? No. You got more. And then they're resentful because you got more. You got more than us. You know, 
We got to work, but you got your own job. No, nobody else around here. And it's almost as if they're resentful. And they bring a spirit of entitlement. But the first thing you need to do whenever you need to move into a new network of successful people, the first thing you have to determine, what are you going to bring to that network? You, you can't just take. You cannot just take from a relationship. Never engage in a relationship where you are not prepared to give first. Give and it shall be given you. The question is, how can I enhance your, um, your life? How can I enhance it so that you're more successful, more happy, more productive, or you bring your own happiness, more productive, more successful, more empowered, how can I benefit you? Now, if you sit down and you analyze that you are not able to benefit that relationship, don't engage in it. But the first thing you need to ask, what am I bringing to the table? And you've got to engage in a relationship from that because I've discovered that all you've got in the universe is takers. People just take, 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 take. So if you can, once what you've given them dries up, they'll go to the next, and they'll go to the next. The best thing that you can do is have someone in your immediate relationship that can help you to build capacity for next. You see, a lot of people can keep you where you are, but can they build capacity in you for the next? Can they provide enough tension, enough pressure to make you want to change? Can they, can they hold you accountable for the potential that you have on the inside of you? Have they ever asked you what you have the potential for? See, th th when you have conversations with people and you talk about potential, it's going to show up in the form of a vision. So another way, another way to address a person concerning potential is to ask them, what is your vision for your life? What's your vision? When people ask, well, how are you going to do that? Say, just give me a moment and let me think. Because you could think your way into anything and out of anything. You could think your way to something. You could think your way away from something. Just give me a minute to think. To move from where you are, it doesn't take a lot of effort. Look at Exodus 23, 30. To move from where you are. It didn't take much effort for that man to walk out of his condition. It just took him, took, it just took him making a decision. It, it, it just took making a decision. I'm excited. I'm stumbling over my own words because I know where I'm going in the message. So I'm trying to get there real fast. It just took a decision. It doesn't take much effort. You don't even have to have 10% right, 20%, 50%. You don't have to have 99%. All you need is 1%. You just need 1% effort, not 2%, 5%, not quantum leap. When you walk out of here, you don't have to quantum leap at anything. You just have to do one thing more. Oh, that, that, that's right, and amen is too weak for me. That is a weak amen, because I'm talking to you, and I'm giving you some facts. You are going to interact with this message. Now I'm getting passionate, because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty mad right now that somebody didn't tell you earlier, and I know they didn't tell you. I don't, listen, you don't need another person in your life making you feel good about where you are. It's all right. It ain't all right. I want more. And I'm not apologetic with it. I'm not apologetic about it. I want more. And I'm going after it. Somebody has to be introduced into your life to bring you into a crisis. And there are so many people that wiggle out of relationships that God has sent to them. You know why? Because everybody else made you feel good. And then when a real individual that has been assigned to you comes into your life, they make you uncomfortable. They make you uncomfortable with you, with you accepting mediocrity. This ain't good enough. 
Well, everybody else, I'm not everybody else. You don't have anybody in your life that helps you to figure out what you're good at, to help you figure out what you are, have potential for. Nobody to speak to your potential. To tell you you could do better. To tell you, stop feeling sorry for yourself and stop telling that same story. You told it last year, year before. You told it to your last friend that walked out on you. Shut it down. Let's talk about where we're going. Let's not talk about where we've been. Where are we going? What do you want? How do you want your life to unfold? And God can show you that. And you don't need to get it all right, but you do need, do need to get something right. And it doesn't need to be a quantum leap, just small little steps. Exodus twenty three thirty. 30. By little and little, I will dry them out from before you until thou be increased and inherit the land. This is what you call the 1% theory of success and prosperity. 1% theory. Now listen to how power this, powerful this is. One extra degree can make all the difference. Martin Luther King said, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But whatever you do, just don't sit here and atrophy and die. Just one degree can change hot water into steam. With steam, we can power a locomotive and generate electrical power to light up an entire city. It only takes one degree. The average margin of victory for the last 25 years in all major golf tournaments combined was less than three strokes. The margin for victory between Olympic gold medal and no medal at all is extremely small and usually less than a minute. It's a fraction of a minute. It's a fraction of an inch. It's a fraction of a mile. It's a fraction of a point. In 2004, in man's 800 millimeter race, the margin of victory, listen to this, was 0.71 seconds. It's the 1% principle. At the Indy 500, the average margin for victory for the past 10 years has been 1.54 seconds. The winner's average take home was $625,324, just over a half a million dollars. Here's something that is really amazing, the 1% theory. The chimpanzee's DNA differs from ours by 1.6%. 1.6% is the 1% theory. That means when you walk out of here, it's not that hard to succeed. It's not that hard to be great. It's not that hard to be prosperous. It's not that hard to be wealthy. You just have to do it little by little. By the inch is a cinch. By the mile, it take a while. So you never be afraid to do something that you've never done before. Because you don't have the experience, you don't have the education, you've got to keep trying. So the paralytic man, I can imagine him getting up. I don't think he ran a marathon because his muscles had atrophied. I believe he got up, he had to learn how to walk again, and he had to choose whether he'll keep on walking. I decree and declare when you walk away from this stage of your life, you're going to keep on walking. And you'll never sit on your potential another day. He had bought into the lie for 38 years, and it paralyzed his ability. It paralyzed his potential. But one word from God... God, through Jesus Christ, gave him the opportunity to change his destiny by demanding that he makes a decision outside of the cultural conventions and man's expectations. They didn't expect anyone that was in that little pool or near that pool under the porches. Under the porches. You know, it's time for you to get up off of the porch anyway. <laughs> You've been sitting on the stoop for too long. Get up off the porch and walk away from the porch. But it started with a, a decision that he had to make. One decision changed his life forever.
So there are nine important decisions that you are going to have to make. The first decision that you're going to have to make about your life is who you're going to serve. And it was Joshua that said, choose this day whom you are going to serve. And he said, as for me and my house, I've made a decision. We're going to serve the Lord. Number one. Number two, you have to make a decision, very important decision, how you will live. And as a believer, you're going to live by the fruit of the Spirit. Number three, you got to decide where you will go. Where are you going to be go at the end of this month? Where are you going to go at the end of this year? Where are you going to end up at the end of your life? Where are you going to end up? And I, I, I feel a prophetic download right now, and I believe that someone here is being anointed right now with a vision, and you are journeying in the realm of the Spirit. God is showing you that you're here, but you could be there. Take that seriously, because it's God speaking to you, and he's going to He's going to begin to download the vision he has for you. He's going to give you a strategy, and you've got to believe what he's showing you right now. And he's going to give you a strategy. He's going to tell you who to call. He's going to tell you what to do. And it's going to happen right now, even as you are speaking to me. Even as, as, as I'm speaking to you and he's speaking to me, it's going to happen. Um, uh, you've got to decide your life strategy. And I tell a lot of people, you know, when, when people come to me and they say, you know, I messed up. I said, look, did you get what you wanted to get? out of this decision. No. Well, don't beat yourself over the head. At least you recognize that your strategy was wrong. So let's not condemn you because of the outcome. Let's fix the strategy to get a different outcome. So you have strategies for everything. You have relationship strategies. You have a strategy for um, how you attract friends. You've got a strategy for how you're living. Everything in life is a strategy. So when people talk to me, firstly, I remove all the guilt. I said, that was your strategy. Does it work? No. Did it give you what you wanted? No. So let's fix the strategy. So when you see alcoholics, that's a strategy. When you see drug addicts, they're using drugs as a strategy to do something. Are you with me? Lying is a strategy. Or everything is a strategy in life because a strategy is attached to a specific outcome. So when you, you know, if you're a believer, you're not going to be hanging out in the clubs, right? But on a Friday night, happy hour, that's people's strategy for getting happiness. Because what they want is happiness. Are you with me? So they're drinking to be happy, but then they have an outcome. They end up having hangovers, and then to, uh, some, unfortunately, end up being uh, alcoholics. Uh, that was a strategy. Do you understand? And so you, people have all kinds of strategy. You read Bible stories. You see a disaster that happens where an entire city burns down, and, and just about everybody in the city dies. And Lot and his family, uh, they live. He has a wife, two girls, they live. Look at their strategy. They've lost everything. So when they come out, in order for them to deal with the grief, number one, Lot decides, I, I can't expend my energy to build anything more. And God said, look, I have this great mountain for you. I have uh, a mountain represents authority, power, and prosperity. So in your future, you got authority, power, and prosperity. He said, no, let me go to Luz. This is just a little city. And let me just hang out there. I'm accepting mediocrity. Just, I, I just need enough to get by. Why? Because he didn't want to expend any more energy, building wealth, building anything. His wife got stuck. Remember, she turned into a pillar of salt. It was an literal pill pillar of salt. What it simply means was she was walking forward but not moving on. Because it was too painful for her to move on. So she just swallowed her, her, her disappointment with life, swallowed it, and, and never moved past that point. Never. She was not going to build again because she's too afraid that she'll lose it again. So she's stuck. And then the girls, their strategy was to be promiscuous. And though that was their strategy of, of dealing, listen to this, dealing with life's transitions. You see, a lot of us have life strategies but we don't have transitional strategies. So when something happens, we end up being stuck because we don't have transitional strategies. We are not here, but we are not there. We're somewhere in between. And we end up in this limbo because we don't have a transitional strategy. How are you gonna get from point A to point B if you're stuck in the middle? And a lot of people live right there. They, they, they just shift their life into neutral and they live there. And they don't expand the energy necessary to go to the next. So they just stay right there. Life just keeps happening, you know, and they're indifferent.
because they don't want to be disappointed anymore. So they're indifferent. Indifferent means I don't care if it happens. I don't care if it doesn't. I don't care if I go to heaven. I don't care if I go to hell. They, don't, they, do, they, do, they just don't care anymore. And there are a lot of people that have been disappointed in life. And that's some of you. And now you don't put, in, you don't put the energies in, in, in it anymore. And I've seen it over and over again. And, and, I, and I see people that live an indifferent life, talented, a, 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 amazing people. And some of you are right here, right now in my life group. And some of you are listening to me right now. You've got great talents. You know you have great talents, great ability, but something happened. Something went wrong. You were disappointed. You had dreams, and it didn't work out. And then you decide, okay, well, I'll just accept this. You don't accept life. When life strikes at you, strike it back. Stop asking, why me? Start saying, try me. Your life strategies are important, and you've got to make a decision about your life strategies. You've got to make a decision, and this is an ongoing activity. And you know why? This is why coaching is important. Mentorship is important, because you get an opportunity to get trade secrets from people who have did, did what you're trying to do, and it may not be the same, but you, you've got to have people around you that are further than wh wh where you are. You have to have those people, and even if you have to pay them, go ahead and pay them. Pay them and get what they got. It's an amazing world. And, and the opportunities are uh, so amazing that are out there. Success is not just for some. It's for all of us. Some of us can see down the road, but we can't see around the corner. That's the difference between a person that knows trends and trendsetters. The trendsetters determine what people do. The people that keep up with the trends, they can be successful. You want to be a trendsetter. You want to not only see down the road, you want to see around the corner, and that's what's a, what, what a vision is all about. Being able to see around the corner, see around the band. People are, far, are afraid of the band in the road, so they end up stopping and building a camp, and they never make that turn. They never go to the next, because it means that you're going to have to give up what you are so that you can become everything that you have the potential to be. But you know how to navigate this. You just don't know how to navigate this. And fear sets in. It takes a lot of courage to go for what God wants. It takes a lot of courage, and it takes a lot of faith. And faith always takes you into the realm of risk. Always. But never, never go back. Never go backward. I don't know who I'm talking to. Never go backward. Never go back to the familiar. Never go back to the comfortable. Never go back. Who am I talking to? Because it's culture that's pulling you back. And you know how to navigate the culture that you've been delivered from. But God now brings you into a new culture. That means that you have to develop a new paradigm, a new mindset. And that's hard. That's hard work. Especially if you have someone that raises a bar and say, this is the bar. I would never, ever go back. I would die first before I go back. Do you understand? Now, you've got to be able to make decisions about your life strategies. How are you going to get from point A to point B? And we're going to talk about life strategies in a minute. You got to make decisions about your relationships. This is number five. You got to be deliberate. Number six, you got to make a decision about your core values. Your core values are your non-negotiable. If they put a gun to your head, you're not going to compromise. What are your core values? A lot of people are Christian. And they compromise their Christian values. You know why? Because it's not their values. So that's why you see compromisation all over in the Christian realm. Because we never took time to say, these are my values. I'm a Christian. And I love being a Christian. And I'm not anything other than a Christian. So that means I want to be like Christ. Full stop. And I'm not going to compromise it because it's not popular. There are things I will not do for no amount of money. You cannot buy me to, to, to do it. 
You get with some people, they're going to be one way with one set of people, another way with another set of people. They're going to be deep over here and shallow over here. You lack integrity. What are your core values? What do you honor? What do you respect? What do you want? High on my values is loyalty. High on my values is respect. High on my values is honor. There are some people that don't, can't even articulate it. High on my values is hard work. That's very high. Productivity is better. But productivity is high on my values. Ask my staff. I don't care how you do it, but here's the goals. You could skate and get them done. You could do backward flips and get them done. But here are the goals. Here's the productivity. My staff could tell you, I don't call. I don't ask when they show up. I don't know what time they show up in my office. I don't know what time they leave. I'm expecting them to be honorable. Nine o'clock, ding, 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 ding. When the alarm goes off, you better be in the office. Why? But I respect them and I trust them. Why? Because trust is high. It's, it, it, it's easy to get trust from me, but once it's gone, I never trust you again. So I show up trusting. I trust you. But keep your word. And if you can't keep your word, tell me why. Let's renegotiate. What are your core values? What are your non-negotiables? I don't drink. I don't smoke. Jesus turned water into wine. That was Jesus. I'm not Jesus. I never turned water into wine. I, I don't drink. It is not my Christian value. But you notice I'm talking about my values. I don't know what your values are. I'm not going to judge you. But I know what works for me. To whom much is given, much is required. I'm a moral, ethical leader. So I got to lead with morality, lead with ethics. Are you getting this? What are your core values? You got to make a list of them. Then you got to pray through. The best way to get a core value is to read the fruit of the spirit. That's good core values. <laughs> you gotta have a, you, you, you've got to uh, make a decision about your focus. What holds your, your, what holds your attention? What holds your attention? What holds your attention? Who holds your attention? What holds your attention? Who holds your attention? What you focus on determines the reality of your future. And if you don't expect something to show up in your future, you better not be focusing on it now. And it's easy. See, the enemy of focus is distraction. What distracts you? Who distracts you? Watch this. I know what my distractors are. People distract me. So I have to be careful because I love people. I'm always there. Can I talk to you? Sure. Even if I have a thousand things, that means I suffer. Where am I going to suffer? I'm a completist. So if I have a goal today and a friend has an emergency, I'm there, right? But guess what? If I give them an hour, that means I got to make up the hour somewhere. So guess what suffers? My sleep. So I'm giving, I'm giving you my wisdom, I'm giving you my time, and I'm giving you my health. So value what I give you. Are you with me? What breaks your focus? Is it TV? Is it your cell phone? I can't believe how many people sleep with their telephone. Like the telephone is their spouse. You remember the movie Her? Where this guy was involved with this, the, the, the voice on the telephone, only to find out she was talking to everybody. Turn that phone off. Make your, your bedroom a, a telephone free, unless you're a medical doctor or something like that. When you, go in your, when you go to bed, turn the phone off and put it away from you. Guess what? Some people sleep, ding, they wake up, ding, they wake up, ding, they wake up. Some of you are laughing. Don't laugh out too loud because I know I'm talking about you. <laughs> Got to make a decision about what you feed on. What you feed on intellectually, what you feed on spiritually, what you feed on nutritionally. You got to make decisions about what you do with your time, 
what you do with your talent, what you do with your life experiences, what you do with your education, what you do with the resources that God has given you, what you do with your money, what you do with your life, what you do with your gifts, what you do with opportunities, what you do with your network, what you do with your relationship, what you do with your potential. You got to make decisions. Finally, there's all kinds of decisions that you have to make. But here's big picture. And I want to make big, big strokes. Number one, you got to make a decision about your spiritual life. Choose this, you this day whom you will serve. Choose life or death. Choose blessing or cursing. God doesn't send people to hell. They send themselves. And this is where people mess up. They argue, oh, Christianity about who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. No, it's not. Christianity is about having dominion here in this earth realm. That's what Christianity is about. Now, your decisions determine your eternal location. Not God. God is not his will that any should perish. Number two, you've got to make decisions about your personal life strategies. Your personal life strategy. Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Do you know what's written in your book? You got to make a decision about your personal brand. How many of you are business owners? How many of you are business owners? Okay. Beyond selling a product, you got to sell yourself. People don't buy products and services. They buy into you. And then what you offer is what they buy. So you got to be able to sweat the details in your personal brand so that you can sweat the equity in your personal brand. This is what God did for Moses. Moses, when he left, he was an ex-slave, an ex-convict. Nobody respected him because he ran away. I mean, you know, the Egyptians didn't respect him and the Hebrews didn't respect him. So now God is introducing him to his purpose and said, look, you're going to be a deliverer. You're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be one of the greatest lawyers ever. And he was like, who, me? Yeah, you. Introducing him to his personal brand. And then he says, okay, so if I'm going to do all of this, who is endorsing me? So God said, when you go, you can use the equity in my name. Tell him that I am that I am until you, the, you increase the equity in your name. This, this is why people drop names. This is why they, they have photo ops. So they take a picture of this person and that person, whoever has a big name. They take a picture, they put it on their um, Facebook, their social media, uh, Instagram. They put it there. What are they doing? They're trying to say, I'm with this person, so I'm as great as that person. They're borrowing the equity of someone else's name. Watch this. So when you go to work, people say, oh, yes, I used to work for Price Waterhouse. I used to work for this. I used to work for that person, and I know this person personally, what are they doing? Borrowing the equity so people can perceive them larger than life. Now, what happens if something happens to that person's personal brand? So if they go, guess what happens to you? You go. So what you want to do, if God gives you an opportunity to be around someone that's powerful, yes, borrow their brand. Take a few photo ops, but eventually you want to increase your own brand so that now people want to use you in their photo op. Can I take a picture with you? You're not saying, can I take a picture with you? The people are saying, can I take a picture with you? What are they doing? They're recognizing that your personal brand is bigger than life and they need to borrow it for themselves. Are you getting this? So you want your name, when you think of Martin Luther King, what's the image that comes to your mind? When you think of uh, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, uh, uh, Stephen Jobs, when you think of Bill, 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 uh, uh, Bill Gates, when, when, when you think of these great people, doesn't that image come to your mind? When you think of Lady Gaga, when you think of Hitler, when you think of Idi Amin, when, isn't, isn't that, doesn't that make you feel a certain way and think a certain way? But that's only what a brand is, is what people think and feel about you after you go.
got to think about this. You got to think about your vision. You got to make decisions about your vision. First of all, you got to make a decision to write it. You got to you got to write out you got to write out your vision completely. Then you got to think about your legacy. Inheritance is what you leave. Legacy is who you leave. Is there anybody going to be left to carry on your name? To carry on your work? People build great works, great ministries, and die. And one generation later, nobody's talking about them. What legacy are you going to leave for them? Let me give you a few more. You got to make a decision about your nutritional health. Don't dig your grave with your fork. You got to think about what you're putting in your mouth. Is it going to be healthy? Let me ask you, did you take your vitamins today? How many herbs and vitamins did you take? How much water did you drink? I know you meant to drink water, but you meant to drink it yesterday, and you didn't drink it. You meant to drink it today, and you didn't drink it. <laughs> you drank that Coke, that Pepsi. You got to make a decision about your social life. Your life will resemble those with whom you assemble. Be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts, corrupts good manners. You got to make a decision about your professional life, your career, your career path. Where, where, where are you going to go? You got to make a decision about your educational life. How are you going to upgrade? I, I, I have so many degrees, but I have to think about upgrading, keeping my mind sharp. So last year I went to Harvard. This, last year I went to Oxford. This year I'm going to Harvard. Next year I'm going to Princeton. All those, absolutely. That's where all the sharp people come out of. So I'm going to keep myself what? Sharp. So you've got to make a decision about your educational life. I attend seminars. Seminars that would, I, I conduct seminars. But I also attend seminars. I, I mentor the best and the brightest. I have the, one of the best coaching programs. My protégés are sharp. They're all sharp. They're movers. They're shakers. They're history makers. All of them. Everybody. So I've got to be sharper than them. They can't be sharper than me. Are you with me? I've got to be able to take them to the next level. Can you imagine them coming? And the last time I was in an institution of higher learning was in 1980. And I'm, I'm teaching them about what in the world? The world's changed. The world that I was born into no longer exists. So you got to upgrade. You got to keep upgrading. Keep your mind, especially if you're over 50, you got to keep your mind sharp. Solve problems. Keep your mind sharp and spongy. You lose your sponginess. You know, I have all young people around me. They talk, tell me all the modern uh, uh, slang, and I can use it right. Mm-hmm. The latest slang in, in, slang in Detroit is, whose man's is that? So, you know, you walk in and somebody is dressed funny, they'll say, whose man's is that? That's the same. Are you with me? Keep your brain spongy. It's, it's incorrect English, but if you're around and they say, whose man's is that? You can't correct them, it's slang. All you have to do is say, I don't know, I, I, no friend of mine. <laughs> when there are people are acting strange and acting crazy, you just say, whose man's is that? <laughs> Ain't no friend of mine. Depart from me, I never knew you. <laughs> you got to make your decision about your relational life. And we're going to talk to you about the types of relationships you need. You need a diversity of relationship, and we're going to list them so that you could figure out who do I need in my life right now. You need a variety of friends. Women, your husband cannot be your best friend. Why? Because men don't like all that talking. They don't, they don't want to hear all that, that detail. You got to have your husband, that's your, your honey, your sweet, sweetheart, your boo, you got to have him. But then you got to have a girlfriend. Download before you talk to him. Give him the cliff note. <laughs> give him the footnote. And don't give him the, you know, don't give him the narrative. How was your day? Make it short. 
Because talk to your girlfriend about that. Don't make, don't make your husband your girlfriend. Are you with me? When you're with a girlfriend, you talk all the details. You know? <laughs> I'm just helping the brothers out, man. I'm helping you out. You sitting up and your, your eyes are crying while they're telling the story. And they say, you're so emotional. And he said, mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's crying because it's like his brain is fried. <laughs> he can't keep the story straight. <laughs> he's thinking about the game. <laughs> Here's the game, and it's a dunk, and you're, and you're, he's like, and honey, listen to me. Yeah, I'm listening, I'm listening. Are you with me? <laughs> Let God's people go. Let your husband go watch the game. <laughs> you got to make, you got to make some decisions about your intellectual educational life. I told you about that. You got to build greater capacity. Ask God to give you supernatural wisdom. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you guidance. You got to make decisions about your cultural life. You got to ask yourself this question. Am I going to embrace the status quo or overthrow it? Am I fond of cultural conventions? Number nine, you've got to talk about your, your, your responsibilities your national responsibility. How are you going to make a difference in your community? How are you going to make a difference in this world? What are you going to do? And sometimes it's through your children. Sometimes a mother has the awesome responsibility of raising the next, the next great doctor, the next great president, the next great scientist. Are you with me? So sometimes your contribution is in parenting the next. So those of you that are single parents, pour everything that you've got into that child. Because it's only 18 years. Nowadays it's 24 years because you got to get them through to their master's degree. But back in the day it was 18 years. But get them, give them the best of your time. If you're a single woman, there's some things that you shouldn't do. Stop bringing all those men into your house with your children. And then the last is your financial life. These are the 10 areas that you've got to make decisions in, and you've got to do it deliberately. Over the next few um, recordings, over the next few lessons, we're going to go through each one of them, and then we're going to give you principles. This is how you make decisions financially. This is how you make decisions uh, socially. This is how you make decisions educationally. This is how you make personal decisions. This is how you make life change. How many of you would love to know how to make decisions? Amen. That amen was weak. Amen. Thank you. I'm assuming that you're shocked. I'm assuming that you're convicted. <laughs> yes. Jesus gave this man an opportunity to make a decision. Jesus did not make a decision for him. He gave him an opportunity to make a decision for himself. What did he do? He empowered. Your destiny is going to be altered through empowerment. When you understand that you have to take 100% responsibility for everything, for where you end up, for how you feel. It doesn't matter how many accidents that you have to go through before you go to work. When you show up and you know that that road is filled with accidents and you still leave the same time, you cannot keep telling your boss, I'm late because of an accident. You got to be able to say, I'm late because I left late. But if you want your job, you're going to leave earlier. You're going to make that decision. You got to stop blaming your weight on baby fat. Your baby is 45 years old. <laughs> Just say, I remember every calorie. The fried chicken, the fried chicken wings. You got to stop blaming your finances or lack thereof on your boss not paying you enough. Your boss did not hire you to make you rich. He hired you to make him rich. You got to stop blaming your emotions on people. 
you choose to feel that way, but you can feel different. You got to stop blaming and take 100% responsibility for where you are right now. Because if you could take responsibility for where you are right now, where you ended up in your life, where you are, where you are emotionally, where you are physically, where you are financially, where you are spiritually, if you could take 100% for your habits, your addiction, take 100% for everything. You are already 80% away from being whole. You just got another 20. If you add that 1% principle, doing one thing, more towards being where you want to be in a year's time, in two years' time, in those 10 areas. And you do that one a day in the 10 areas. That means you are dedicated to doing 10 things a day towards being where you want to be at the end of the year and at the end of your life. It's just a matter of time before you get there. There are 365 days in a year. 365 times 10 is 3,065. Who cannot accomplish their th dreams with 3,650 steps? Who can't? You can be what God wants you to be. Do what God wants you to do. You can become whatever you want to be if you just understand that the decision is yours and the next move is not God's. The next move is yours. Thank you very much. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we give you praise and honor. There's so many decisions that we have to make. Such a challenge. Even as we go back over our notes, we are all challenged to do something different. And it doesn't have to be that quantum leap. It's just that one thing that we are choosing to do, one thing different. And I pray, Father, that you would empower us, that you would give us the wisdom, Holy Spirit, that you would convict us, that we would interact with this message, that our lives can be changed and truly we can become a blessing not only to the kingdom, but to our, in, our, in our industries, in, our, in, in this world, in our communities. We bless you for everything that you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen. What a powerful word. There's power in your decisions. Thank you, Dr. Trim, for challenging us. And if you're watching around the world, there's a couple of decisions I want you to make. I don't want your experience with us to end right here. We want you to become a partner with the ministry. So I want you to decide right now to sow a seed into this ministry monthly. You can click the link right there, the give button. You can hit the link in the description bar above if you're on Facebook. But you can give any amount, $25 a month, $100 a month, as we go to bring hope to the hopeless and healing to the hurting souls around the world. Another decision I want you to make right now is to make up in your mind to be in Atlanta, Georgia on December 7th and 8th for End Your Year Strong. You've got to be there. And guess what? If you don't make the decision now, the time's going to pass you by and everybody's going to come back with all of the stories of how great God was. And you said, if only I would have made the decision months ago to buy that plane ticket, to register right now. It's only $39 for a limited time. You want to go ahead and get the early bird price right now, $39. Go ahead and register right now for End Your Year Strong. And guess what? We'll see you back here every first and third Thursday where it's live, it's prophetic, and it's all God. God bless you.